and right on China. Uh, but uh, obviously, uh, the message um, is not uh, uh, restricted to China studies. It could be applied uh, to any other subject. Uh, it doesn't have to be even uh, area study or social science or humanities. It could also be uh, natural science. Um, and and the migrant status or migrant identity, so migrant consciousness, affect scholarship for obvious reasons because migrant scholars would have to uh, to win recognition from the uh, hosting society. How they um, do their research? Uh, can they be either? Um, uh, someone with uh, special cultural or intellectual resources to contribute to the understanding of some subject um, in the uh, hosting society. So it does not have to be China study or even humanities. Um, and sometimes we could imagine uh, with the short of uh, human resources available in uh, some of the uh, natural sci scientific fields in the United States, for example. You see a lot of uh, uh, departments basically recruiting students from Asia, um, especially those uh, uh, fields uh, requiring good control over mathematics. Uh, and there's, of course, the stereotype that Asians do mathematics. Okay. I'm cold. <laughs> uh, I remember at one time when I was um, with uh, this, this famous chain store, Jimbo Ree. Have you heard about Jimbo Ree? I was at a Jimbo Ree uh, buying things for my little one. Uh, I think it was long time ago, at least 20 years ago. Um, we were shopping and uh, I was waiting because he was playing little things. And uh, the uh, clerk came to me and asked, so uh, what are you doing? Uh, I said, I teach. Then he immediately re replied that the mathematics. <laughs> so, so my look uh, immediately categorized me as a mathematician. Uh, this is kind of stereotype, but anyway, you could imagine uh, this uh, either negative or positive or some kind of stereotype uh, uh, image uh, could generate sometimes enormous pressure on migrant scholars. I have another uh, personal experience, not my, my, my own experience, but my uh, close friends telling me he's personal ex experience. That was uh, in 1999 uh, when um, this um, sharing of Chinese embassy in Belgrade took place. That was 1999 or 2000, 1999 perhaps. Uh, he had been teaching in the States for quite some time, at least over a decade, I think. But right after the shelling, he thought he was quite successfully uh, mixed with the um, uh, both the community and also his uh, his institute, but then uh, the day after the shelling, he uh, went to work. He just suddenly felt that he did not know how to interact with his colleague, because the bombing. Uh, seems to him that exposed him being a Chinese. He was, he's a Chinese professor. He uh, went to uh, the United States and then he was able to state in the state after 1989 there was a, uh, a policy to, to grant uh, Chinese students in the United States to stay uh, after 1989 if they could demonstrate their political participation during uh, the Tiananmen Square. Um, so he was one of those uh, uh, students in that generation staying in the United States, successfully getting his PhD and found a job and taught there for 
for uh, about a decade, I think. And he has been in the state, of course, for over, at that time, 14, 15 years, I believe. And he thought he was quite uh, Americanized uh, in terms of uh, uh, life, arranging life, and he shopped and he played uh, uh, tennis and kind of things uh, with his American colleagues, and they have family uh, gathering uh, during the vacations. And he, of course, enjoyed Christmas instead of a Chinese New Year, since uh, uh, no one would uh, in his community would celebrate Chinese New Year at that time. But then, interestingly and uh, curiously, that he felt immediately reduced to someone different because of the shelling uh, taking place the night before. And he felt he was unable to easily greet his colleague in the next morning uh, because the shelling, uh, to some extent, had aroused his sentiment of being a Chinese. And he felt that uh, this was an act, uh, if not deliberately, but at least was targeted at China. And he came from China even though he thought he had al already been Americanized. But then the shelling immediately generated the anxiety inside. He did not know how to react to his colleague. And he felt that his colleague similarly did not know how to greet him. <laughs> Maybe that was his own imagination that he said, but then uh, he, he, he felt there was something uh, uh, going wrong between uh, colleagues. Um, I guess this was the kind of indirect pressure that his identity of being a Chinese created for him after a serious confrontation um, um, outbreak between his country and his, his home country and his hosting country. So it was uh, sometimes uh, Uh, indirect and, and unknown even to the actors themselves, that there has been such a pressure inside, subconsciously. Uh, also, a friend of mine, uh, he's, I don't think he's a teacher, but he, he's a lawyer, I think. And his wife is a teacher, is a, is a college professor, and he's a lawyer. They live in a quite uh, um, Americanized uh, communities. Uh, the kids play around with uh, neighbors, uh, but then uh, they have their ancestors play with them um, in their house. Uh, they discussed when they bought a house and entered the house, they discussed where to place their ancestors. Play. Used to be in the niche of war back in uh, Taiwan. They had you know, they're this little frame so they could put their ancestors play there. Uh, going to the United States, uh, they had that uh, uh, in their apartment, which is fine, when they were students. And then they become professionals, and they are living in a uh, suburban, uh, men, middle class communities. And their kids playing with one another, uh, with neighbors. Uh, they then they thought about it that, that would that what would it be when kids from a neighbor come into their house and saw ancestors played and they would have to explain what that is or whatever and they are living in a Christian society do they want to be viewed uh, as someone weird or bizarre because they are they're worshiping not God or Jesus or, you know, but their ancestors. So they, they decided to, uh, to move their ancestors' play to second floor <laughs> in a little den on the second floor. It's not second floor. It's actually between the second and the third floor. Uh, there's a little den on the side. So they moved their ancestors' plate in to that little den where... Um, the housewife uh, work 
on her papers and preparing her uh, teachings and things like that. So that was also a kind of uh, a pressure that immigrants oftentimes feel when they try to fight recognition or acknowledgement in the hosting society. Imagine how a professor would feel uh, since certainly the professors teaching in a different society would do that, would feel the same kind of pressure, indirectly or directly. And we could uh, uh, look at both migrant scholars in the American or European, American, Western Europe, American societies. We can, of course, also look at migrant scholars in um, Asian society. We could look at, for example, Chinese scholars teaching in Japan, Chinese scholars in our paper, in our readings, Chinese scholars teaching in India, or Chinese scholars teaching in Singapore, in Hong Kong, or vice versa. You'll find uh, uh, Indian scholars teaching in Taiwan, for example. Uh, that kind of uh, uh, comparison, comparing a migrant scholar in, uh, in a uh, underdeveloped society or developing society and migrant scholars teaching in uh, Western Europe or United States or Canada or Australia, how they would uh, uh, feel their uh, social relationship and how that may affect the, the presentation of their scholarship. Uh, I think you are, do we have anyone going to report, do summary today? Uh, Hui Yi, do we have someone doing, no, okay, yeah, I just want to make sure. In our readings, I think the uh, one extremely important case would be Tan Chong. Tan Chong has been, has moved to Chicago, I believe, after he, a few years after he retired from uh, Delhi University. Um, he, uh, he, he was born, I think, in India and his, uh, I, I don't remember exactly, uh, either his name or his, uh, some of his, or nickname, whatever, was given by Tagore, I think, because his father was the, perhaps the first migrant Chinese scholars in India teaching uh, at the Indian's first Institute of Chinese Studies, which, uh, primarily introduced, ironically also, introduced Buddhism back to India. Buddhism, of course, came from India and went to China a long time ago, but then uh, Buddhism seems to uh, decline uh, dramatically and the Buddhist texts are in Sanskrit, uh, not uh, even available in uh, India. So you have a lot of um, re-importation or re-exportation or re-importation. Uh, it's kind of a, a return trip of the uh, Buddhist text from uh, China to India. So we had this first Institute of Chinese Studies in Shantanikitan, which was three hours uh, by train from um, uh, Calcutta, I think. Um, and of course, uh, this is uh, uh, what we call Vista Bharati, uh, also called International University. Or, or World University. Somebody just called it Tagore's University <laughs> sometimes. Uh, at this international university, there's the first Institute of Chinese Study was set up. And incidentally, when Chiang Kai-shek and his wife visit India in order to convince India join the uh, Second World War to fight against Japan on the British side, <laughs> uh, Chiang Kai-shek actually visit the, um, the Institute of uh, Chinese Studies. So you can see how uh, this has been an important place. And Tan Chong was the son of Tan Yunshan, who was exactly the Chinese intellectual helping Tagore establish the Institute of Chinese Studies at the Shenton Nikitan. 
And Tanjong, uh, with this relationship, of course, uh, was uh, quite well connected in the Indian society. Even though he act well, then he went back to Hunan and get uh, some of his education before he returned to India again. Uh, when he graduated from college, he was able to teach Chinese in one of the university uh, in a Chinese program sponsored by uh, Ministry of Defense. But basically, it's a, a academic institute. Nonetheless, he immediately draw attention of uh, Indian congressmen right after, in the aftermath of the 1960 war between China and India. And someone uh, in, uh, during the um, uh, questioning time raised the question with uh, Naiklu, uh, the uh, premier at that time in India, that do you know that there is a Chinese uh, teaching in an institute sponsored by India and a trained Indian interpreter to uh, to listen, abs you know, all kind of uh, kind of a spying uh, activities along the Chinese borders, and uh, and record uh, the Chinese radios. You know, so those Indian interpreter being trained by Tanjong, could you trust that? So uh, then Tanjong would have to lose his job because of this kind of suspicion uh, toward uh, him as a Chinese. Or perhaps there was no suspicion toward him as a Chinese, but there was a deliberate political harassment by the opposition uh, toward uh, the, uh, the uh, incumbent uh, government led by uh, Naik Lu. So Tanjong lost his job, but thanks to uh, Naik Lu's uh, uh, coordination, he was able to start another position. And interestingly, uh, this has something to do with uh, United States because United States took advantage of the border clash between China and India and uh, intervened in the Indian uh, scholarship uh, because of the Sino-Indian War in 1962. Uh, the Chinese programs in many of the universities were closed down, including Shenton including the Institute of Chinese Study at the International University, where Tagore started. Uh, in two years, nobody studied Chinese uh, except those who were ready to do the um, spying work, recording the radio uh, talk that they could, uh, received on the Indian side. Uh, so the only China study left in India would be the think tank kind of China study. Basically policy oriented, basically watching China's diplomacy and, and uh, national defense kind of things. Uh, treating China as the enemy as a dramatic contrast with the previous uh, Chinese program uh, which proceeded upon the assumption that India should know China as a friend, friendly country. And as a matter of fact, still in, Naihu, in, the, in the mind of Naihu, he still treated China as a uh, civilizational ally. Both Indian people and Chinese people were anti-colonialism, anti-imperialism, and they of course should come together, they should come together. Um, so that has also been the image of China in Naihu's mind. Naihu actually went to uh, international university after the war, um, continued to claim that Chinese people and Indian people are friendly um, relationship. Uh, but but that, that didn't really uh, help very much to uh, improve the relationship between China and India. So you have uh, American taking advantage of the uh, border clash war and starting um, invest in training China scholars in India. So you have CIA donating um, through 
Ford Foundation um, a seed money to recruit five Indian students each year to study in the United States. A few of them went to Harvard and came back, become very good scholars. Um, uh, but this basically is um, part of the American strategic planning in the academic world. Nevertheless, Tanjong was in charge of this seed money together with a Taiwanese, um, interestingly, who later become uh, a solo's kind of a businessman. <laughs> but anyway, um, these Taiwanese young scholars getting a master's degree from Columbia University, taking the job of CIA. He was a Chinese major. Uh, then he went to New Delhi to set up the fund with his um, very affluent uh, uh, salary. He was able to save a lot of money. And later on, he used this money to join investment banking and the all this, all this, uh, you know, the financial games he started playing. And then he was, and he became later on the key persons to introduce European investment to Taiwan. Um, so he was, he became very, very rich person. <laughs> but anyway, that was just a footnote. Uh, that he and Tanjung coordinated. He was the person managing the financial side for CIA. And Tanjung, of course, was the person managing the academic side. And then Tanjung was able to teach at the University of Delhi. And then he, he grew up. With all this personal history, imagine how a person would deal with the Indian China study community with his first job being taken away because of being a Chinese. Uh, with the larger background of a Sino-Indian border clashes, then you would have to think of his own scholarship. How could he be accepted with dignity by the local community or someone who understands China and understands China in a way that could help Indian society uh, in whatever uh, possible way? And not coincidentally, I think, Tanjong took a very strong uh, position against American uh, Sinology, uh, especially the one represented by Fairbank. And you could uh, imagine the Fairbank school uh, is almost everywhere, even today, if you talk to uh, senior scholars in history uh, who teach China, um, especially in the United States, but not limited to the United States, you'll find uh, the majority of them has some connection with Fairbank. Uh, not just in the United States, but also in Europe, in Japan, anywhere, you find that the Fairbank school, or not necessarily a school of thought, but at least the Fairbank connection, Fairbank network, has been so wide, wider than anyone could imagine. Um, even though people who are not directly benefit from Fairbank's teaching or advising, uh, they um, indirectly benefit from uh, students of a Fairbank. Uh, and of course, the Fairbank Center has trained some of these Indian scholars. So Tanjong start his career by criticizing Fairbank, and his doctor dissertation was a serious criticism of Fairbank. Uh, at the time of his retirement, he had uh, also launched a very strong criticism against uh, the notion of clash of civilization and the Huntington. <laughs> so he began his a scholarship, a scholarship by criticizing Fairbank and, uh, and the finishing official scholar, 
official position in the academic world by criticizing Huntington. So he has been consistent in his very uh, sensitive and um, uh, determined positions facing the United States. And of course, you know that Indian has always been a very uh, proud scholars, scholarship. And the Indian scholars uh, oftentimes hold a quite scientific view of the American scholarship, even though many of them uh, study United States. And of course, Indian scholars debate one another. Uh, there was not easy uh, consensus uh, from Indian uh, scholars. Two Indian scholars meet, they could uh, discuss and debate for the whole day. Uh, one uh, um, episode of my encountering with uh, Indian scholars, of course, the oral history project I have carried out in India. Uh, in some other society, for example, Korea, <coughs> we often have a hard time pushing the interviewee the senior scholars to say more <laughs> because Korean scholars uh, are usually quite uh, uh, reserved. Uh, <coughs> the answers they provided to uh, the interviewers oftentimes quite concise and short. So we had a hard time pushing them to answer. But in India, we had the exactly the opposite problem. We had a hard time stopping intellectual from talking. <laughs> Once you ask a question, it could give you a long story of what have happened to his or her uh, life or career. Mm. So you don't have easy consensus from uh, any number of Indian scholars. Um, that said, uh, Tan Jung nonetheless feel himself being a some kind of outsider. But then he had a strong personality. He refused to be an outsider. He wanted to be an insider. He wanted to think, act, write, just like any other Indian scholars and debating them, uh, like any two Indian scholars debate each other. And he would like to present his scholarship in such a way that his Chinese identity would not become a burden. The Chinese identity could become a burden in two different ways. Number one, because of the Indian-China border clashes, so the Indian scholars holding some kind of uh, suspicious attitude toward China, and he being a Chinese would have to deal with this burden this political burden, which he himself never created. Number two, <coughs> if he joined Indian scholars, taking an aversion kind of a attitude toward China, then he would immediately uh, place down his own Chinese um, background. If China is being uh, sus suspected, being considered inferior, at least ret with in rhetorics, then he as a Chinese would become inferior. So just two different burdens. One burden is that he could not afford being um, a defender of China because that's against the mainstream. But on the other hand, he could not join the mainstream to step down on China because that would be a uh, insult to his Chinese identity. But then he was able to criticize Philback, which everyone would consider to be uh, the, at least one of the most important uh, scholars in the world on China, if he was able to criticize Fairbank from a Chinese history point of view by utilizing Chinese classics 
by using Chinese historical documents and demonstrate how Fail Bank has misrepresent China or misinterpret China. If he could do that, then he showed it is extremely important to understand Chinese document, to read Chinese classic, because only if you could read Chinese classic and Chinese historical document could you provide a solid, plausible criticism of Fail Bank. Uh, so Tan Zhong did that. Once he did that, that China could not be simply just looked down upon as an enemy or just portrayed in a negative perspective. It was China had to be more than that because China would enable people to criticize America. And America is in, as a representative of imperialism. Right? This is in the mind of both China and the Indian scholars at that time. So using Chinese document to criticize the United States could, could, uh, could enable Tanjong secure an important epistemological place in the Indian scholars, among the Indian scholars. Because he was better than others in terms of using Chinese documents, in terms of using Chinese literature in the classic, in terms of fighting against American imperialism. So he was not defending China in any sense, but he defend the importance of understanding China in a much longer historical perspective, which certainly cannot be uh, pushed aside just because of the border clashes with China. I thought that was a very, very, I'm not sure this is and uh, this might not be in his mind, this, is, this might not be an intellectual strategy of survival in Tan Zhong's mind when he started his research on Fail Bank. And I think his uh, disliking of Fail Bank could have been there for a long time uh, or could have been there just by reading Fail Bank, he felt something wrong. So academically and scholarly, he had hundred reasons to oppose Fail Bank. But then, uh, as he developed, as his intellectual uh, capacity grew, I have the feeling that uh, I get the impression that he realized how important his knowledge of Chinese history and his ability to use Chinese document and the literature when he criticized Fail Bank could be useful to his uh, to his position positioning in India among Indian scholars. Uh, so I could see uh, Tan Chong uh, become one of the most critical scholars in Indian on the United States. Despite that his son later went to the United States, despite that after retiring, he also moved on to the United States for family reunion. Uh, this had never really uh, changed his, uh, his uh, uh, critical um, sensibilities toward the United States. That's one. Uh, one, uh, I think, important example that usually people would not see when they talk about migrant scholars. You know. uh, this is a migrant scholars from China to India rather than from China to one of the uh, presumably higher society in West Europe or United States. But then we have other scholars uh, Incidentally, another scholar we discussed was Akila Ilya, who was used to be the head of the American uh, Association of American Hi History, and also uh, had the lead Fairbank Center, um, not Fairbank Center, the Fairbank Center or Yanjing Library. I forgot. He had led uh, probably Fairbank Center uh, for for some time, 
uh, or Yanjin Institute. Either way, uh, Akila Ilya, as a matter of fact, was the student of John King Philbex. <laughs> so his scholarship, of course, was quite different from Tan Chong. Um, Akila Ilya was quite thankful to the support the Felt Bank had lent him. After he graduated, uh, he was able to find jobs with the support of the Felt Bank, and he was able to develop his scholarship. But we have to remember that Akila Ilya went to the United States from Japan at age of 20-something, uh, a society which was just defeated by the United States because of the uh, aggression uh, in the 30s and 40s, uh, which was done in Asia. So there was a historical legacy, known or unknown to Akira Ilie, at the time when he went to uh, the States. If you look at Akira Ilie's scholarship, you find there's one very specific stream of thought throughout his career. Uh, that is to find common ground between different societies, especially between China and the United States or between the United States and Japan, uh, even during the wartime. So he endeavored to demonstrate whatever going on politically in the world, even though in an extremely confrontational way, there could still be uh, connections, cooperations, good feelings, uh, or a common interest that group people together from all those society in confrontation with one another. Uh, I think there was, of course, this is also his personal choice, the subject of his studies and the approach he took. But then I think there, there had been something more than just choice. It's not random choice. I think it's also choice uh, quite fit into Akira Ilya's career and his Japanese identity. Uh, I remember that uh, when we had this oral history with Professor uh, Ilya in Taiwan, he gave an example uh, on how people seemingly in conflict actually sharing a lot more in a much deeper sense. He used the example of music. He was uh, questioning those people who represent their own countries when they had problem with one another, they represent their own countries, seemingly uh, obliged to portraying the other side as evil forces. But in their real life, they could enjoy same music. Uh, music is beautiful. And Akira Ilya believed that if we could find all those things that people, no matter where they come from, who they are, like, if you can identify those things people all like, then you could demonstrate to people how silly or stupid they are, reducing or trap themselves into mundane confrontation over little things, little interest. Because music, arts, seeing, nature, a much deeper, uh, longer term things uh, that one has in one's own life and much longer, of course, and much deeper than uh, a little political dispute, which always being uh, exaggerated into some uh, national issues, some become the uh, foundation of nationalist, nationalist cause. So Akira Ilya was very uh, sensitive 
for this little, seemingly little, but he could elaborate on this seemingly little things into really deeper and meaningful uh, common ground between people. That's his scholarship. And so he was not all, he, I rarely see him criticize China. And I saw him, uh, to saw him or read him trying to convince the Chinese uh, that Americans are not what they thought the Americans were. Um, uh, liberalism was not all that uh, uh, terrible things. But then, of course, Chinese have their own uh, historical trajectories. And Japanese have done something wrong historically. Uh, I think that's the message the Chinese wanted to hear. <laughs> it's unfortunate that all the Japanese scholars welcome in uh, China would have to first say that Japan did something wrong, otherwise they would not be welcome <laughs> in China. Um, then Akira Iriya was ready to confess that the uh, Japanese policy during World War II or before World War II uh, was not something to be celebrated. Um, so he had been to China several times, and I saw his message consistently to reconcile, always try to reconcile people on two sides of the conf confrontation. So, so in that sense, Akira Ilya, as a Japanese scholar, in American, uh, in the discipline of history, in American discipline of history, was able to show how he was able to um, gather from historical documents that the people uh, have been composing one society. There's one mankind, there's one human society. And he called his own scholarship centrism. I think that was a very interesting uh, term, centrism. Centrism meaning that um, he was on he was not on this side or that side. He was on neither side when there was a confrontation. He was always taking the central position. Central meaning neither nor from, from his scholarship point of view. That he always tried to find uh, common ground that does not belong to the political positioning of either side. Uh, that reminds me a little bit of the Kyoto School. <laughs> Uh, Kyoto School was trying to show that how Japan being real uh, universal by being able to enter the Japanese conditions or entering the European conditions or entering the Chinese conditions. Japan was able and ready to enter different cultural and civilizational conditions. That was, that was uh, one important message of Kyoto School. But when I, when I mentioned this about uh, you know, the similarity between Ilya's centrist position and uh, Kyoto School's uh, philosophy of uh, nothingness in the center. Uh, one of Ilya's close friends was very, very unhappy. He felt offended. <laughs> he felt that Kyoto School was such a notorious uh, school of thought, a notorious school of philosophy. How could Ilya, someone who loved peace, who have devoted his whole life to peace be um, uh, similar to a uh, philosophy which becomes the uh, philosophical foundation of uh, war criminals uh, during World War II. Uh, of course, that's not what I meant. I had nev never meant to say that uh, behind Ilya's peace, quest for peace, there was a, uh, an, um, either intentional or unintentional drive for conquest. No, that was not I. I want to say. What I want to say is there has been a Japanese worldview which prepared Japanese scholars to think, uh, to move away from Japan's positions in order to appreciate what's going on in other places. And we've discussed this 
things in our class about moving away from one's position. And I think Ilya shared that kind of uh, predilection of trying to appreciate what had been going on in different parts of the world. And he had tried to preach people and learning how to appreciate the other side. This reminds me a bit of the idea of a second track diplomacy. Do people know the second track diplomacy? Second track diplomacy is about diplomacy where uh, intellectuals, professors, uh, people from society meet with one another in order to come up with new ideas, new place, new items to cooperate so that they could transcend the confrontation at a national level. That's called a second track diplomacy, to find resolution, to, to find plausible resolution or alternatives to confrontation that has been going on at a national level. That's called a second track diplomacy. And the second track diplomacy has been the, uh, has been created by, you will never believe this, uh, by a psychoanalytical institute in Philadelphia. Uh, it was uh, a project trying to bring uh, the um, Palestinian and Israeli scholars coming together. Uh, I'm not sure if they consider themselves being successful, but that, but that was the idea. So you would have scholars representing extremely different sides to come to the same place and enjoy your life. Uh, they ski together, they're talking about their family, uh, they play uh, Go and they play other you know, games together for about a week before they start talking about resolution of conflict between their two societies. So this is an idea of breeding human uh, emotion uh, toward one another, and then they start discussing things be after they realize they're dealing with human beings. They're not dealing with, uh, s they're not dealing with evils. They're dealing with human beings. So the whole idea of a second track diplomacy is to first demonstrate to all sides that we're all human beings. And I think Akiri Iria had thought his mission along the same line, uh, trying to demonstrate through historical document how people have been able to cooperate and help one another even during the time of crisis and during the time of confrontation. So that's Akira's uh, scholars scholarship. And of course he was enabled, he, it was not appropriate for him to pick up a site uh, in the United States Oh, well, somebody could have done that, but he decided not to position himself on China in terms of whether or not Communist Party should be uh, studied in this or that way uh, in a revolutionary histo historiography. So Communist Party will represent a new, new stage of Chinese history, or Communist Party was no more than another dictatorship, or even worse, than any other dictatorship that you could have found in Chinese history. Whether there's a revolution in history or the history continue, that was one important debate. Uh, who should be blamed for war? Uh, who should be blamed to start uh, Second World War? Who should be blamed for to start uh, Cold War? I think Ak Ila Ilya uh, avoided this kind of positioning when he developed his scholarship, when he grew. And that was a difficult thing to do in a academic atmosphere which people constantly ask this sort of questions, asking your position. But he was able to direct people's attention away from this politics of positioning and into an area where people have to uh, reconsider positioning as a uh, useful, meaningful, epistemological tool. 
or maybe we should look for common ground instead of a positioning or legitimacy or moral principles. Uh, so that's Akira Ilya's decision in the United States that present his scholarship in a way acceptable to whichever positions you take. Uh, I wouldn't say that he had the strategic planning <laughs> in his mind when he was young, doing his PhD and the fellback. But I would say along his career, as he matured, he find a different way to contribute to scholarship, a different way that will allow him to avoid positioning in American historiography and allow him to contribute to the to the resolution of confrontation at a much higher philosophical level, or you could say much deeper level, hum much deeper and wiper fundamental human, le human level. You could also say that. Um, but that's the way he positioned himself. I think that was, uh, um, uh, this is, a second example that we have found in our reading. There are other examples, you know. Uh, if you have time to have gone over the readings, you could also, um, you know, discuss uh, the famous scholars of Chinese foreign policy, uh, Samuel Kim, who come from Korea. Actually, although he came from just Korea, but later, the hometown where he came from become North Korea. <laughs> so you could say he's a North Korean, although there was no such thing as North Korea when he migrated. Well, actually not, because he, you know, he grew up under Japanese uh, colonialism. Oh, well, he didn't grow up. He was born uh, in uh, the time where Japan was the, uh, Japan control what Japan colonized Korea, and then he uh, uh, encountered Soviet troops when Russian defeated Japan. So there was a Soviet troop arriving in North Korea, and then he uh, took ship to the south and entered South Korea, and then worked for uh, American uh, soldiers, American general actually. Uh, in the um, American military barracks. And then he moved on to the United States. Uh, he studied uh, French when he was in college. So he could speak, at least he encountered multiple languages, Japanese, Russian, Korean, uh, English, French. But then he decided to study China, so he would have also acquire Chinese. <laughs> uh, it's incredible uh, career, I think. So you could also read uh, uh, his story in, uh, in the readings. And then, of course, there is another significant figure, um, John Wang, who was born in, I think, born in Shanghai, grew up in Hong Kong, studied in Canada or United States. And then he found a job in Singapore at a very, uh, peculiar time uh, in Singapore, a time where anti-communism was rising at a time uh, 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 scholarship on China was also needed. There's a peculiar time in that sense, in that uh, ironic si sense. On one hand, you have this very uh, cautious, or you could even say uh, alert, alerting attitude toward communist China. On the other hand, you sense this need to understand and study China. So you need somebody to, to, to help you. So Li Guang Yu set up this Institute of East Asian Studies. He didn't even call it China study, but it studied China. Later on, of course, some, some Southeast Asian subject pop up, but primarily it, is, uh, it has been an institute 
concentrating on China. And before that, it was not called East Asia even. It was called a Confucianism, a study of Confucianism. So you could see how sensitive it has been in Singapore to study China. So somebody had a joke that uh, China study in Singapore has never been indigenous because you are not allowed to study or understand or touch anything in China uh, during this anti-communist period. But then you need someone to study China to help this think tank to grow. And John Wang was picked up by Li Guangyu. So John Wang developed his scholarship in Singapore as also as a migrant scholar with multicultural background. Um, so you could, add, you know, uh, when I was in Singapore, when I would talk with um, an indigenous scholar, uh, they questioned my uh, oral history project with John Wang because they say, you know, John Wang's not from Singapore. If you have John Wang representing Singapore, then you don't understand Singapore. <laughs> I was like, no, <laughs> because John Wang represented what Singapore's China studies, um, I would say earlier essence, earlier characteristics, anti-communism. So you have to recruit someone from outside to do China studies so that your society will not gain unnecessary access to Chinese information. But you still could understand China. And to avoid Singapore's China, and China studies being seriously affected by purely methodological approach in the United States. So John Wang recruit a lot of scholars from China. But then in order to avoid Singapore being trapped into all those Chinese information, John Wang insists on the use of social science methodology. So you have a combination of a social science methodology, a group of scholars trained in United States or Europe, and someone who know Chinese, come from China, uh, are able to acquire piece of information from China that's not accessible to scholars uh, in the United States or in West Europe in general, and also short-term scholar. So you don't see all these uh, migrant scholars from outside coming to the East Asian Institute to stay for five years, no. They stay for a year or two years and they leave. So no one could dominate the thinking of the think tank. And John Wang has been the only exception until Zheng Yunian uh, arrived in uh, Singapore upon the invitation of Li Kuan Yew. And Zheng Yunian had been the only person who has been able to acquire a tenure at National University of Singapore. Even John Wang had not had tenure. And Zhou Yunian was the only one who had tenure because Li Guangyu liked him. So that was John Wang, that was uh, Samuel Kim. Each had a very different encounter in their career and made all kinds of choice to present, to develop, to prepare, to develop, and to present their scholarship to boost a, ho a hosting society and a home country because their scholarship will be read both by their colleagues in the hosting society and also by their countrymen in the home country. So they really have to think politically how to situation uh, their, their approach, how to make sure that they could, they could contribute um, to one particular community without alien alienating the other, or reversely, in some other, on some other agenda, contributing to their home society without alienating their, their hosting society. Between home and host, between their understanding of China and their, uh, their need uh, to be a human being, uh, it's something that you really have to think consciously. It's not something that you could say, 
oh, I don't care. Even when you say you don't care, that's a deliberate decision that has to be made. It's not to say, I don't care, I do what I want, I do what I like. That's not, uh, that's not uh, uh, random. That decision of not caring sometimes is, well, I would not say, I would say all the times, it's a decision. I mean, it's, it's exactly the same kind of decision which may lead to a completely different choice of either method methodologically or theoretically. So thematically, you could be a realist for some reason in order to be accepted, acknowledged by your community uh, so that you could contribute, so you could be recognized. In some other situation, you have to switch your language. Uh, so migrant scholars is like scholars in post-colonial society, facing all kinds of intellectual challenges receiving all kinds of intellectual resources. Not all of them are compatible with one another. So at one point of their life, they have to make decisions. And oftentimes, they have to make all kinds of decisions as their career develops. Uh, these are intellectual choices, these are political choices. Um, but migrant scholars face more constraint compared with local scholars in a post-colonial society. Because in post-colonial society, people don't remember where. So you can be a uh, ardent um, uh, promoter of theme A today and theme B tomorrow, even though the two themes are in contradiction. You cannot do that, do that as a migrant scholar. Because people watch you, people listen to you, and the people remember what you have said. So being a migrant scholar, making your intellectual choice and also political choice, it's quite a difficult task. So it's not surprising to see that most migrant scholars choose a theoretical position that would allow them to remain neutral um, most of the political agendas facing their hosting society, or even sometimes in their home country. Tanjong has been different uh, in the sense that he wanted to be radically critical of the United States. But being radically critical of the United States is a statement of neutrality on China in India. Because in India, people would want to see whether you're pro-China or not pro-China, or you're anti-China. So using Chinese literature and document to be extremely critical of the United States is still a state of neutral neutrality. Um, you don't see this kind of neutrality in a post-colonial society, even though the same combination of scholars, intellectual resources take place. Um, because in post-colonial society, you don't have serious scholarly agenda um, which you have to adhere to in order to keep your scholarly credit, your academic credit. Um, in Korea, in Taiwan, in Hong Kong, you see people adopting different or even contradicting methodological approaches. It doesn't matter as long as they can publish. <laughs> If they can publish something, it doesn't really matter whether you write certain things in one paper and another thing in a different paper. Uh, because you're writing for different audience, because you're writing uh, for different taste of the journal. Uh, so you could, you, could, you could change. It doesn't really matter. But if you are migrant scholars, you cannot do that because you are being watched by the hosting society.